But this is where we should say a big warm welcome to my guest tonight, who is Michael Sheen. Hello, how are you? I'm very, very well, thank you. Good. So I just have to mention here, Joanna Stevens, Emma Smith, Lady Nicola, Scott Taylor and Pete, because they all guessed correctly you'd be drinking red wine tonight. <laughs> <laughs> we gave you the choice and I know maybe we didn't. Maybe we just bought a bottle of red wine. Is that all no, we did? No, I did specifically ask for red wine. You did specifically yes, ask for I red did. wine. OK, we did give you the option of beer as well. But, and uh, we've got some nibbles in as well. So uh, you, mm, you just sit back and feast. Nibbles. Yeah. <laughs> the idea is that you're just here and you've chosen some songs for us and we'll talk about the, uh, the programme you're in at the moment. Um, okay. But next I have to do this. It's a new single from Arcade Fire. It's just I literally materialised about an hour ago. Do you like that band, Arcade Fire? Uh, yeah, very excited about the new album. Yeah. Heard mixed things about it, though. Have you? Mm. Oh, maybe you've got the inside inside knowledge. Right, we'll play it and then uh, we'll talk more after this. So this is Arcade Fire and it's After. There you go, Arcade Fire. And the track was called Afterlife. That's the second track to come from their new album, which is called Reflector, and that comes out next Monday. And um, we'll have that as a favourite new thing because it's uh, there's a novelty factor. We want to hear it again, want to play it to you a lot again. So I'll play that for you tomorrow night on this show. Uh, what did you think, Michael I Sheen? I thought that sounded pretty good. Yeah? Okay. I don't know where all this mixed... I know, no, from? you've just talked down Arcade Fire. Now people won't go and buy the album. It'll be, See, you it'll play be your it down. fault. Yeah, you play it down and then people go, I think that's brilliant. <laughs> that Michael Sheen, who knows nothing about music, which I think we're going to prove for the next track that <laughs> you've chosen for us to play I think tonight. we are about to prove that beyond any shadow of a doubt. <laughs> how, was your, how was your day today? My day today was very, very busy. Mm -hmm. I was on the one show. I was today. watching you just before yeah. you came here, yeah. And Talking what did you learn on the I one show? I learned that moles have what looks like human hands. Why has this not been picked up on before? I know. Well, uh, people will be listening to the show this evening that will have a theory about this. Okay. So, so moles Why have do human moles, hands. or what do you call them? I, I asked the, the Mike, who was the expert on it at the show. He didn't know. Okay. What do you, because you can't call them paws. They're clearly not paws. Mm -hmm. They are closer to human hands than anything I've ever seen on an animal before. Okay. So if anybody out Apart there has monkeys, the answer for obviously. that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and how was your weekend? Were you in the UK for the weekend? Uh, I'm uh, in Dorset at the moment doing a film of Far From The Madding Crowd. Ah, so I was okay. down in Dorset. And the character that you play, I know someone's been messaging me about it tonight. All right. Okay. Well, I basically say um, it's about a story about a woman and the three men in her life. There's the shepherd, the soldier and the old one. Mm -hmm. which I leave it to you okay, to fine. work out which one I am. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what happens these days? Is that how life's going? Yeah, pretty much. The fact that I can even be considered as a possible love interest for Kerry Mulligan excites me beyond anything. So the fact that I'm the old one, I don't care. Okay, so it's Kerry Mulligan's in it? Kerry Mulligan, Wow, yeah. and how And the director of Festen. I don't know if you've ever seen that film, no. Festen. It's an ama if you haven't seen it, watch it. Okay. It's an amazing Danish film from a few years back. Uh, Thomas Vintenberg, he's directing it. So I thought that's a very interesting combination. Wow. And how long into the filming are you? How many? I think we're done? over halfway. We finish mid-November, I think. Right, OK. Yeah. Um, so what's, what have you been doing? What kind of uh, conditions a are you working in? A lot of walking around countryside, hoping it's not going to rain. Oh, the weather's been lovely for that this weekend, yeah. too. Yeah, it does rain, obviously. Uh, but I get to wear lots of long coats and get on horses and scare sheep. Okay, and how are your horseman skills or whatever it's called? Well, I first learned to gallop on a horse, or not learned to, I first galloped on a horse across the desert, in the, the Sahara Desert in Morocco. I did a film called The Four Feathers years and years ago, and um, with people like Heath Ledger and Wes Bentley and uh, Chris Marshall and Rupert Penry Jones, all people who were brilliant on horse. On a horse. Um, I was terrible. And okay. my first experience was galloping across the Sahara Desert, and I was unbelievably terrified it is it's yeah absolutely terrifying so have you improved have you got a lot better not as bad as riding a camel though okay when did you ride a camel uh, on the same, same film. thing yeah uh, and i've always said ever since never ride anything that can turn around and look at you whilst you're riding it <laughs> just to check out how terrified you are yeah yeah awesome. um right let's play a track now you've chosen okay. some of the music we're gonna have on the show tonight so pl explain yourself you've chosen asia I'm, to play i'm slightly now. concerned that you chose that one to be first as if that's going to be indicative of my musical taste yeah i was hoping that it would be sandwiched between two slightly cooler choices but no. nevertheless. I, i'll just tell you listen, dear, dear listeners the only way is up from here okay so <laughs> it well, does improve you say that but i remember one of my fondest memories of as a teenager was um practicing my bmx skills on uh, on the schoolyard of the school at the end of my street as the sun was going down with on my headphones of my Walkman mm -hmm. at the time. Old school. Uh, Asia's song, <laughs> Heat of the Moment, playing. Um, and everyone hate, hated Asia in mm. the music industry. They all thought they were terrible. Yeah. And I can understand why. Um, but just recently, 
I've become obsessed with this song again. I just, listen just to you it though. all the time. Yeah, just me. Okay. I'm completely obsessed with it. So I thought, rather than choosing like my three favourite songs of all time, I thought I'll just choose the songs that I'm really listening to a lot at the moment, and I'll be honest about it, yep. this is one of them. So, I've never said this before, that was Asia on Radio <laughs> 2, and Heat of the Moment as chosen Dear by... Dear listeners, Joe Wiley is sitting here in yeah. tears, <laughs> saying, I used to have a career. Yeah, but, but, but there'll be people out there who love that song, will remember oh, it. Maybe it took it. them back to the same place. Michael Sheen chose that, by the way. And um, where did it take you? <laughs> Not me. Where did that take you back to, though? Why did you choose that again? It takes me back to my BMX. On, the BMX. Uh, on on uh, Blind Bagland School <laughs> Yard. Yeah, doing doing that stuff. But also, it's been, I've been writing something over the summer, and it's a, a, a piece about a, a, a serial killer. Uh, and it's a true story. Um, and he was sort of operating around the sort of mid-'80s. That song... Uh, came out in 1983, I believe. Okay. Um, and so I sort of started listening to music from that period again whilst I was writing the piece. And when I came across that, suddenly listening to those kinds of songs, but in the context of a serial killer at work in the Seattle area, um, it gives them a sort of edge that they never actually had in life. And suddenly they become extraordinary. Um, and so that song, you have to think of it okay, in the context fine. of a story a about a serial killer. killer. Fine. Um, on Twitter, I was just trying to check out Twitter and see what people were saying. Uh, Laura says, uh, Joe's playing Heat of the Moment at the request of Michael Sheen. Glad that's clarified. Such a cracking tune from a cracking actor. There you go. So people are liking the reasoning for, for choosing uh, Listen, that. I will stand by it. I am obsessed by that song. Actually, you know, I quite, I quite like a bit of Poodle Rock. That would have been great at karaoke. Oh, I, I yeah. bet you've done it at karaoke. Oh, I have. Oh, you have. Oh, yeah. Um, but more importantly, Moles. Moles, okay, yes. Okay, so um, this is because you were debating about whether moles have hands or paws or mm-hmm. what it exactly is. What do you is. call them? Well, Robert in Bridgewater says, how about mole grips? Thinks they might be that. Nice. You've got your own theory about I've this. I've got my own theory, which is, if they're mole fingers, mm. could we call them mingers? <laughs> fingers. Well, you could because toes, if you've got really long toes, they're called tingers, because mm. I've, I've got extremely long toes. Right. Oh, and also you could go from mingers to, like in the sort of um, uh, London Cockney rhyming slang way, Charlie's. Charlie okay, Mingus. Yeah. <laughs> so Look at the Charlies, Charlies on that mole, <laughs> people will be saying from now on. Simon Craig in Winchester's probably got it right, though. He says uh, they're actually called pentadactyl limbs. Of course they of course are. It, of course they are. Mingus and Charlies sound much better. Um, Asia's heat at the moment and pentadactyl limbs. limbs. Uh, this is apparently they're shared with horses, whales, uh, whales, bats and humans. <laughs> Whales have something that look like human hands coming out of them at some point. <laughs> this is all getting very much like the mighty boosh, isn't it? Wow, it really is. Um, literally, it means five-parted limbs, hence they look so much like ours. Evolutionary links are clear to see. Simon, thank you for clearing that up. Thank you Brilliant. so much, Simon. And if you've ever got five minutes to spare to have a coffee, <laughs> I'm your man. <laughs> Sheen's your man. Yeah. Um, we're going to do the parent taxi, and Michael will read out the parent taxi suggestion. So if there's a song that you would like us to play, if you're doing the mum or the dad taxi, you're driving around, you're waiting outside a swimming pool or something like that, you um, You've got to text him very quickly. It's 88291. So the song we're going to play next is um, something. It's Michael trying to claw back any kind of credibility that he possibly can. Why yeah. have you chosen this song and what is it? I don't oh, know. You don't what know? is it? Okay. <laughs> Surely I should have given you a script. It's Savages. <laughs> ah, right. Okay. Well, um, uh, so I, I uh, live in Los Angeles and I have done for the last 12 years. My daughter lives there, so I live there to be with her. And um, I, so therefore I'm not up on the current scene a lot of the time. So the one UK. of the things that I do every year is when the Mercury Prize nominations come out, I get every single album and listen to them because I figure it's got to be some good stuff. You are the Elton John of the acting world. Exactly. And um, so I was listening to all this stuff, which is all marvellous. And this is probably, the Sa- Savages is probably my favourite album of all the albums, Whoa. although I thought there were some fantastic ones. Um, uh, and so I just wanted to choose one of those songs. I just think they're amazing. Have you seen them perform at all? Do you know what they look I like? I haven't. Okay, at all. right. So the, the girl is very um, androgynous. She looks quite a lot like Ian Curtis, the way she moves around on stage, very right. much like Ian Curtis. Mm. So mesmerizing to watch as well. Mm. So with that in mind, we'll play Savages, and this is She Will. Hey, you've clawed it back, Sheen. That's okay. That That's great, isn't yeah, it? a ball of fury, that, isn't Come it? Come on. Band are called Savages, and the track that you just heard was called She Will. And seriously, try and get to see them live. You were oh, just well. saying that you, um, what show was it, Jimmy Fallon? That I went doing? on. Uh, yeah, on a chat show in America, Jimmy Fallon, who's great, mm. um, and he's very into music and he loves to get like British bands over there. And so I said, um, you have to get Savages on here. You have to get, you will love them. So you're now launching their career. I'm launching the their States. American very good. career. Yeah. Uh, when you do these shows, because like, Jimmy Fallon, I think, is is he considered the best of those shows? Certainly from I here, they're the moment, very for, clever. And especially for a younger audience mm. as well. You know, you've got Letterman, who's the kind of, you know, the stalwart, and then Jay Leno on the other channel. 
uh, Craig Ferguson, Scottish Craig Ferguson. Yeah, sort of how brilliant. did that happen? That's amazing. I know, extraordinary. But he is kind of brilliant. And yeah. then Jimmy Fallon is his equivalent, I mm. suppose. And he's and, had Justin Timberlake on and done those yeah. really funny skits. Well, Jimmy Fallon came through SNL Saturday Night Live, so he's very connected you know, to that group. And he's sort of seen as being the kind of younger, hipper one. And he's got the roots as his house band. Who That's was great. Right. Um, so it's a great show to do. I, I do like it. And you must get to meet some really great people when you do all these shows, kind of doing well, the rounds. That, that weird thing where yeah. you're sitting in like the green room or something. I remember doing the Jonathan Ross show and sitting next to Noel Gallagher. Oh. And having a conversation with Noel Gallagher about Hamlet, which I was about to do at the time. <laughs> it's a slightly surreal thing. Yeah, yeah. he was asking all the questions. Yeah, he said, uh, uh, I went to see uh, I went to see Jude, Jude Law do uh, Hamlet. Oh, yeah. Uh, and and I said, oh, what do you think of it? He said, it, it were four hours. <laughs> that was it. That's that was it. <laughs> yeah, he's a funny man. Yeah. Machine is my guest on the show this evening. Just, well, I say guest, co-host, I guess. Um, it's an <laughs> evening in with Michael Sheen. But I, I just want to um, put you right. Paul Farrow has just emailed in. He said, Michael Sheen claimed Hang on. that the oh, above no. song, Asia, in the heat of the moment, was released in the summer of 83. Actually... Here we go. Get your facts right, right, when you come on my show in future. Actually, it entered the UK Top 75 singles chart on the 3rd of the 7th, 1982. Ah. Uh, it peaked at number 46, staying on the chart for three weeks. Listen, if that is the only comment about mm. me choosing Asia's heat at the moment, I'm sitting pretty. Now, listen, I'm protecting you. There are a lot of other <laughs> yeah, comments as well. Don't, don't think that was just There's it. smoke coming out of the computer. Here. <laughs> uh, we'll do the parent taxi now. So this is for all those people who just drive around and they wait for hours and hours outside sports halls and drama centres and stuff like that so um, I'll life. do something yeah yeah exactly mm-hmm. do you do that for oh, your daughter's Lily yeah. that's all I do What's what does she do what's her, her big thing she, her big thing at the moment is she's a cheerleader yes. did I ever think when I was growing up in Portalvert that my daughter one day would be a cheerleader <laughs> I went back to LA for a day a couple of weeks mm. ago I flew back from here because cause I'm filming here and she was doing a, a thing called Homecoming Mm-hmm. where she was a cheerleader for the football team Ameri- and when I say football team I use that term loosely okay, obviously it was American an American football team, football team. Um, and it was uh, under floodlights on the pitch at the school and there's fairground rides and I was like I'm in wow. Greece I'm in the film Greece this is it and my daughter is there anyway yes I do that all the time right cheerleading yeah. okay so we'll do some mentions now um, I'll do the first one taxi service waiting outside Stanford Art Centre for daughter Francesca and two friends who were sleeping over hurry up I need wine um, and give a shout out for dad taxi for Lucy and Claire Stanton on the way back from having just returned from a day's filming for a feature film in Oxford Paul that's that's not normal that doesn't normally happen <laughs> yeah. Go on, you do some more now okay this one is hi Joe and Michael please say hi to Maxine side note name of my first girlfriend mum's taxi for the night picking up her 16 year old son Billy from his shift at Waitrose in Winchester. Loving the music. Mm-hmm. Thanks. And I'm assuming that's Asia. Possibly. Tony and Truro picking up daughter Emily from sixth form in the pouring rain after 12 hours at school. Hi to you. Uh, hi, Joe. Just picked up my son, Lewis, from winter cricket practice at Ivy Bridge Community College in wet and windy Devon. Lewis would like to hear Howls, which I always have to say as Kenneth Williams, by passenger on the way home over Dartmoor. Thanks, Corinna. We'll try and fit that in later. Um, Maxine, how old were you when you went out with Maxine? Uh, 14 slash 15. Oh, so it was an enduring, lasting relationship. Uh, it was my first proper she, Maxine one. was your first okay yeah. um, we'll play this for anybody it's kind of got the theme of baking as well because we're going to do a mixtape and we need your baking suggestions so this is for anybody doing the parent taxi service really? Michael Sheen is here he's uh, hanging out on the show this evening drinking red wine is the second or third glass there uh, I think we're on to the second bucket now can we yeah. see is, is there anything left in the bottle no there's nothing left in the bottle at all <laughs> let's um, play more Asia <laughs> let's not Master of Sex <laughs> this is what you're here to talk about you're doing this TV yes. show at the moment yes um, so uh, Tell us a little bit about it, in case people haven't seen it. I think we've seen the second or third episode here in the so. UK. I think so. I think the third episode goes out tomorrow, I yeah, think. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and America is on the fourth episode, so mm. only a week ahead. And it's about 12 episodes, aren't there? So there are 12 episodes in one season, yeah. which was kind of different. I'd never done a TV series before like that, where you, essentially you're telling a story over 12 hours rather than two hours in a mm. film or a play or something. So that was kind so of it's quite exciting. Yeah, quite slow and a lot of detail yeah. as well. And the character that I play in it, Bill Masters, he's a real person, and he uh, was a... Uh, gynecologist uh, and a leading light in his field and a fertility expert in the mid 50s in um, St. Louis in America Uh, but his lifelong passion was to do this study of sex and and the effects on the human body and no one had really done that before Kinsey had done sort of anecdotal stuff before but no one had actually watched what happened and he invented a thing called Ulysses which was a glass contraption 
um, that I, I am loving this because we watched you on the one show earlier and you were trying sure to pick your way through words. You could be <laughs> yeah. a little bit more. Oh, they were very here. clear. I know what I wasn't allowed to say. That was very apparent. Um, so yeah. a glass contraption, a glass of a certain contraption shape. Um, of a certain shape. Yes, that looks a bit like a thermos. Um, that um, whereby you could watch as a woman find some a certain satisfaction. Uh, and you could watch you, inside. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Joe has just moved out of the studio. Uh, and he, so he invented this. And so you could actually see for the first time what was going on inside the body. Mm. So this study that he did obviously was hugely controversial um, and he risked his reputation. But at the same time, you know, it, it, it meant that he had a chance of becoming a huge pioneer in his field. So he and his partner, uh, Virginia Johnson, um, it's about them and it's about the study and about their relationship. Mm. And and why did you particularly want to do this? I'm intrigued because there are so many great TV dramas at the moment, and yeah. I imagine if you're living in LA, um, I just wonder how it all works. Kind of well, which is, roles yeah. you get and why you choose which ones. Well, TV is sort of like that's what everyone talks about now. Mm. You know, you're not really talking about necessarily the big films that are out. You're talking about the Breaking Bads and the you know and the Mad Men and, and the yeah. Homeland, Game of Thrones, and all these kind of things. And so TV has kind of completely changed now. So some of the best writing I think is going on in TV. Um, it's also it was about a subject that I thought was probably going to be interesting to people, <laughs> but it was a kind of intelligent take on it. It wasn't gratuitous. I didn't think it wasn't exploitative in any way. Um, it was coming very much from a sort of female perspective as well, um, which was kind of interesting. And um, and it meant that I could work in L.A. and uh. not have to leave my daughter. Mm-hmm. And, you know, obviously your daughter absolutely mortified at you oh, doing this role. You, I it's like a imagine. child's worst nightmare. Yeah. Isn't it? It's like I took her to the heights of me being in Twilight, which was her favourite thing in the <laughs> Coolest world. Coolest thing a dad to could ever do. now I've taken her down to Dante's Inferno. Her dad is in something called Masters of Sex while she's 14. Has she watched it? Uh, not as far wouldn't. as I know. Would I mean, I've, I've been getting texts and emails from friends of mine going, I made the terrible mistake of watching your show with my parents or with my children. Uh, uh, and, and not that I'm saying that it shouldn't be watched intergenerationally, mm-hmm. um, because I feel there's much to learn there. Mm-hmm. And, and it's a platform for discussion. My sister said that her son actually started talking about sex for the first time. I'm so sorry, Joanne, if you're listening, <laughs> that I'm outing you on the radio. But, um, but that he actually the next time opened up about it. Okay. So you never know what's going to happen, but... But next time he see, sees Uncle Michael, he'll be like, oh, yeah, but I've seen you in ways I don't really yeah. want to have seen you. Yeah, I know. It, oh, poor things. I'm so sorry. To all my family, mm. I apologise officially. What, what has Lily said about you, Dins? She, um... Can I, can I say what I told you? Um... I Possibly so. not. <laughs> <laughs> no. My daughter has a quite ribald... Is that the way you pronounce yeah, that's it? Right. Sense of humour. Um, it's quite earthy. Uh, and she sent me a text yesterday with a photograph. At the moment in L.A. and New York and places like that, there are buses with just the picture for the show on it, on the side of the buses. And so she sent me a picture. Clearly, she was in the car, and she took a photo of a bus that had pulled up alongside. And it, So she sent me a picture of me. And you know kids these days apparently mm-hmm. uh, doing this thing where they, you can write stuff on the on the photograph. And she sent me a text saying, prepare your... And the final word sounds a little bit like... Oh, it's that game again. Yeah, what would be the word? What would you choose? <laughs> All I would say is it begins with an A, it begins, uh, yeah, and it ends in an S. Yeah, and it's round the back there. That is Lord and Royals. Um, such a big tune. We had it as our favourite new thing uh, a few weeks back now. And number one, pretty much, is d- d- going to sweep the globe. Have you had you heard that track? Yeah, Michael? yeah. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And she's so young. She's only 16 years old. No. Yes, really young. You are yeah. kidding me. No, I'm not. Um, so living in LA, do you get to see many bands? Uh, yeah, well, I, I um, go online every now and again and I just look up who's going to be playing in LA this is one of the great things about living in Los yeah. Angeles is that pretty much everyone comes through and plays bands wise um, and then I just buy loads of tickets to things and hope that I'll be around to watch mm. them um, and uh, you can get to see especially British bands you can see really big like stadium filling British bands playing quite small places in America because they're trying to like crack America or whatever so you go to places like the Whiskey A Go-Go which is a mythical place Yeah. Uh, when I went through my big doors phase which I believe everyone has to go through at some point um, th- that was like where Jim Morrison first started doing gigs where he couldn't even look at the audience he played yeah. gigs with his back to the audience at the Whiskey and I remember seeing like years and years ago I remember seeing the Stereophonics there and um, and you see these kind of you know big bands there but the last um, band I saw were Alt-J 
Oh, yeah. At the Greek, I think it was, in L.A., who were unbelievable. And before that, I think it might have been Crosby, uh, Stills and Nash, Ooh. which was amazing. You're such a big music fan. Oh, it, I, I love it. It's yeah. the only thing that keeps me sane over there. Is it really? Yeah. It really it's, is. It's, yeah, it's quite a surreal place to be what, it's living a very and artificial place. Yeah. and all those things. Yeah, very peculiar. But I, um, uh, it depends on where you go, though. You know, like I was, I, funny enough, I was reading an article, an interview with the Arctic Monkeys, mm. only yesterday. Uh, who I believe live in Los Feliz in Los Angeles, and they were saying, um, you know, there's knobheads everywhere in there, and you just <laughs> and it's true. I thought that is the best way of saying it. There really are. People think of the kind of the the cliched idea of LA as being oh, it's all very surface and superficial, but you just you just start to choose where you go and the people you hang out with and all that kind of stuff. I should ask some questions that have come through from our lovely listeners who all are right. here tonight. Okay. So, um, are they more uh, Asia related questions? No, or they're mole not. finger. <laughs> Nothing to do with mingers whatsoever. (laughs) God, I hope you get that role. Um, (laughs) Lord Mole. Sharon Neal says, what roles do you prefer? Real life character like Blair or fictional ones like in Twilight? Mm -hmm. I I have to say I like, uh, it's the variety that does it for me, to be honest. Mm. It's, It's not any one role. It's, being able to move between different genres and different scale of, of parts and that kind of stuff and real and imaginary and all that kind of stuff. Um, did, have you auditioned for any of the, the TV dramas that are around at the moment? Was there, was, are there any parts that you didn't get that you tried oh. for? Um, oh, gosh. N- not really, no. The first, pretty much the first TV thing I was offered was um, Masters of Sex and that was the first one I did. Um, Films-wise, I remember back in the day when I was in L.A. and I had no career over there whatsoever. I remember it was a low point for me Mm -hmm. where I auditioned for Alien vs. Predator. I think it was some sort of geeky computer guy who had like three lines. I really cared about it. I didn't get it. And I thought, something is not going right here. Oh, dear. Alien vs. Predator. Alien vs. Predator. You couldn't even get that I'm not dissing Alien (laughs) vs. Predator as a film. I'm just saying that was a slight low point for me. Um, Heidi Griffin really enjoy Masters of Sex. Is there scope for a second series? Oh, definitely. I'm. I mean, their story goes on and on through mm. to the 80s, 90s, and they were together for. Well, they had a very peculiar relationship, and they worked together for many, many, many years. And um, uh, they uh, and, and you know one of the fascinating things is about how culture. Uh, had a changing relationship to sex partly as, because of the mm. work they did so I, I hope we can move through all the decades and I can eventually end up with a bald head and white <laughs> tufts of hair which is what he actually looked like uh, Darren Scott says I think his passion piece The e- the Other Easter was a very you know, envious piece of work big fan of all his work okay that's just a compliment um, Emma Smith says oh he's a red man surely ask him how hard Fantabulosa was to get into character for I loved it that's the Kenneth Williams piece yeah alright I will tell you that the, the hardest day of filming on Fantabulosa was first thing on a Monday morning about 7 o'clock in the morning having to stand naked in front of a mirror pretending to satisfy myself in front of a film crew who were still eating their bacon butties for <laughs> breakfast That's that was tough that was a tough day um, and Ian Fraser in Aberdeen what's the most enjoyable platform for you as an actor TV, cinema or theatre? Ooh, I have to say radio is radio is your my thing oh you're not after medium. my job surely <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't dare I would just play Asia and ELO yeah you would day. and see how many listeners you'd have Phil uh, Burbage says I've always thought Michael would make an amazing Bond villain would he be interested Mole finger. <laughs> yep, sorted. And uh, this is from Helen says, I can't believe that you're sitting beside or even near Michael. Uh, when I saw one of his earliest <laughs> films, me neither. Um, when I saw one of his earliest films, The smell films, that comes lands. off him is so bad. <laughs> I can't believe you can be that close. I was captivated. This is by Heartland she's talking about. Oh. He's a proper actor. Could He could play any role and do it fabulously. And he's Welsh. There you go. Heartlands, uh, Eric Bristow's in Heartlands. Really? The great Eric Bristow darts player, yeah. I did a scene with Eric Bristow. Of all the people I've done scenes with, possibly Eric is the one that I'm most starstruck Did by. he teach you anything? No, we were. We had a panel of glass in between us. We never actually got to speak. Oh, no. It was like brief encounter. Shame. And the next thing you're working on, so you're doing the Thomas Hardy thing at the moment, and mm. then do you know what you're doing after that? Uh, I, I might be doing something uh, in South Africa, possibly. Um, but I'm still waiting to find out if we do the second series of Masters. Oh, OK, so it's Hopefully all resting on that. Yeah. OK, right. We're going to do our album reviews and uh, we'll play right. this next. Paul McCartney. 
So this is the title track from his new album. You've heard it quite a few times, I suspect. It's Paul McCartney and it's new and it went straight into the album chart at number three. Um, just to run through what's happening with the album chart so you know, John Newman uh, is at number one. We'll talk about that album in just a bit. It's called Tribute. Pearl Jam and Lightning Bolts at number two. Then it's Macca. Then it's Closer to the Truth Share, again to be debated soon. And uh, Jonathan and Charlotte's Perhaps Love is at number five. Chris Salmon's here with us now. How are you? Hello, I'm very well, thank you. Good. Um, I know we, it's not normally wine on a Monday no, night, but does it suit exciting. you? Yeah, no, it's good and this is the nearest to Brian Clough I think I'll ever get. <laughs> oh, so you're a happy well man. Well excited, yeah. <laughs> it's not bad hanging around here, is it, no, on a Monday? That's good. Um, although you were cursing me over the weekend about some of the albums you were listening to, but more yeah, of that a little, little bit, bit later on. <laughs> uh, let's just hear a little bit of the uh, Paul McCartney album, so not aside from that one track. Okay, so that was Paul McCartney and his album is called New. And uh, Chris is going to tell us what he thinks of the album. I am. It's a, it's a, it's a good album. Not, it's, it's hard, isn't it? I was thinking earlier, like if you're a footballer, you kind of have to retire when you're 35. Mm. When your body kind of gives out, and you've got to retire. And people can only look back at the glory days. It's like you, you just look at the pictures and the videos, and you sometimes wish your musicians they could do that because mm. it's, it's decent. It's good. There's some nice stuff on it, but it's by no means a kind of amazing album. It's certainly not up there with his best or anything like that. There's three or four really nice songs, but mm. how does it compare with um, his last album or recent things? Well, the most done? recent one was like a covers album, wasn't it? Um, so this is all this is all original songs first first truly original album for about seven years I think and you know he's, he's worked with some younger pr- producers he's tried this one song sounds a bit like the beta band it's got sort of loops and it's a bit kind of you know a bit experimental I guess but you know he's, he's just at his best when he's got good songs is and, anything as good as frog chorus well no <laughs> in all honesty it's oh, probably not I have that single I bought Do that you? It's a great yeah. single yeah. I mean that thing he's not, a, he's not had a hit like a proper hit for about 25 years you know and it's sad because you just want him to have a proper hit single mm. I know but he's obviously worked with these producers thinking that maybe that is what will happen because he's worked with Mark Ronson uh, Ethan Johns also oh gosh George um, Martin's George, son Giles Martin yeah. and the other Paul one Epworth. is Paul, yeah, Paul Epworth. he yeah. also kind of gets to work with whoever he wants to work with though, yes. he? like he, he fronted yeah. Nirvana not that long ago yeah, that was, I know, that was bizarre that? wasn't it that was strange yeah that must be an extraordinary position to be in imagine being a Beatle well this is the thing this is the theory with him is that there's n- no one can say no to him you yeah. know? he's Paul McCartney you like so go hey what do you think of this song you're not going to go to be honest it's a bit rubbish but Paul. you want somebody to do that to just yeah, go right, Paul, I'm going to help you I'm going to kind it's of make so this so often really the way song. you know like you wake up and you think ah, I want to I think I want to front Nirvana today. Yeah, exactly. Or I think I want to be captain of Manchester United today. <laughs> yeah. He could do that. You wouldn't, it's totally true. You can do that. It's yeah. totally true. And you know, and that's kind of the good and the bad about him because he's you know he's obviously a legend and he's wonderful and it's great that he's still out. And it's great he's still making music. He doesn't have to. He does it because he loves it. He's always pleasantly surprised by this album. I thought it, I did think it was a good album in comparison with other things that he's done in the yeah, past. Yeah, maybe it's better than other solo albums he's mm. had for sure. It's not. It's by no means his worst solo album. It's decent. It's mm. hard when you've got Helter Skelter. Well, this is there. it hanging over it. And when you've got the choice of listening to this or any of those other albums, you know, it's very it's hard tough. to go, do you know what? I will listen to the new one with four or five slightly ropey songs, you know? Oh, no, but being that person, what would you do with the rest of your life? Oh, it must be it. such an awful situation. Mm. I mean, it's well, it's not, not a terrible situation I don't think you can play. No. I'd quite happily be you there. But a bizarre one. United. Exactly. <laughs> you True. You were, just, you were just saying that you met him. Tell us I met, I met him once uh, on an aeroplane and I was, as you would be, very aware that Paul, Paul McCartney was sitting across the way there. And then halfway through the flight, he came over to me and he went, I know you. I've seen you on the telly. I was like, yeah, I've seen you on the telly a few times. <laughs> and that's my Paul McCartney story. That's good. That works for us. Yeah. Um, okay, so out of five, what would you give this Paul McCartney album? Uh, three. A three for yeah. Paul McCartney. I mean, it's, it's not... That's fine, it's, it's leave a, it there. You know, that's good. It's decent. Yeah. It's decent. Decent. Yeah. Damning praise. Right, we'll move on it's to Lissy, shall we? Let's be honest. Not, yeah, what's your view on Asia, Chris Salmon? Have you ever I, heard I, of him I before? couldn't match the excitement <laughs> of Michael, I'm afraid. <laughs> right, this is uh, Lissy's album in a nut. And that is Lissy. The album is called Back to Forever. Uh, went into the chart at number 16. What do we get with this album then, Chris? I mean, I was just saying to Michael, she's kind of a sort of modern version of Shania Twain to me, a mm. sort of countryfied pop singer. She makes, you know, she's good. She makes, she makes. Now, wait, I had her in session and she, live, she's yeah, very, she's, very accomplished. She's got a very really, strong voice. Really strong. I mean, it's just, some of the, the, the lyrical content is a bit obvious. It's like singing about her hating her job and singing about her boyfriend's rubbish and then singing about how much she loves her boyfriend it's kind of obvious you know there's one song with a bit of grit but apart from that it's, it's you know it's pretty obvious but she does it well you know she, she it's good songs if you like that kind of country tinge sort of thing mm. you know she, she is it did, worth spending your money on though to get I mean, you know it's i personally wouldn't you know it's it's not really my bag it's kind of say if you like the sound of 80s tinged country pop then yeah michael i'm still reeling from the news that shania twain is dead <laughs> And on that point, <laughs> how many to get out of five? 
Uh, another three, I would say. Another three. So yeah. it's a it's a decent album. Uh, yeah, yeah, similarly decent. Okay, right. And can I clarify, Shania Twain is not. She's not dead. She's not dead. She's no. I can see people, dead. people. I don't want a sort are... of Orson Welles War of the Worlds <laughs> scenario growing out of this. you remember where you were when? <laughs> yeah. I don't want that. No. I'm Shania sorry Twain if I upset much... anyone Shania. by saying that. <laughs> Alive and kicking, as is Cher, who is back with a yeah. brand new album. So, um, should we listen to this? This is how Cher's album sounds. Right, so, Cher's album went in at number four, and it's called it Closer to the Truth. This is her 25th studio album. 25 albums she's done. Um, Michael, are you a fan of Cher? Have you met Cher? Uh, I Do you know her? I don't have Does a Cher story, I'm afraid. But my daughter's favourite tweet of all time is from Cher, which begins, Rant! Exclamation They're mark. always good, aren't they? I have amazing friend. And then she goes on about this stuff. And I was also at a karaoke birthday party recently where the person whose birthday was was being Cher and sang every song not by Cher in the style of Cher. Wow. I and urge you all to <laughs> imitate that on your birthday. <laughs> to have a Cher karaoke party. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Cher, go on, tell us what I mean, the album's it's, it's like. It's her most successful intrigued. album so for a long time. She's been away for a long time. It's about 12 years since she's released a, a studio mm. album. and She's been away a long time. She's come back with just a really... It's like a sort of one-woman Eurovision. It's a proper kind of upbeat disco pop album with a couple of slowies, you know. Mm. It's and, it, and for what it is, it's very... Because she's worked with people like Paul Oakenfold. It's for the age... She's as old as my mum. I find it a bit odd. What like, age is she? Do you know? I've got to say what my mum's age is oh, now. No. You, what <laughs> are you doing mum, to me? Please forgive me. Yeah, 67, I think. 67, which yeah. is a good vintage very, she's doing very well my mum and is so do they is look Cher. similar Cher, not your really my mum doesn't tend to sort of undress for photos like Cher does <laughs> thankfully <laughs> <laughs> I guess yeah again it's that whole thing of where you position yourself what do you do when you're, you're Cher when yeah, you're trying I mean, to compete with in Lady a way, Gaga uh, you'd, you'd like her to kind of make a sort of Johnny Cash Neil Diamond one of those kind of I'm getting old and I'm going to make a sort of beautiful old sort of um, yeah. experience be sort of a record yeah but if she's made a you know it's a disco pop record and it's a good one the songs I mean, it's ridiculous it's hilarious and it's daft but you know it's quite good it's certainly catchy it's like say it's it's like a Steps album or something, but with really good songs. <laughs> 67 year old Not Steps. Wanting to I'm looking at the info phrase. here, and she had yeah. uh, she's had a number one single in each of the past six decades. I yeah. I mean, that's extraordinary. It's very extraordinary. It is. Yeah. I was reading an interview with her over the weekend, and I, I actually felt sorry for it. It was her whole life story, and they were saying that she was a little sparrow of a woman, and she was, you know, she got cold, and I just thought, oh, God, it must be hard work being Cher. Yeah. She sat astride that gun turret on that aircraft carrier though remember oh, yeah. that's not a little sparrow that's not what little sparrows do <laughs> no remember that? tough li- i know and what was that some of the lyrical content on this record is not that of a lyrical of, of a little sparrow it's quite um is it a bit rude? forthright and quite rude one of the songs is it quite considerably which rude, one is that take it like a man okay i believe fine. it's called <laughs> <laughs> and we're back to Masters of Sex <laughs> and we are indeed um, can I just ask another email that's come through Martin Michael Sheen is uh, such a versatile and charismatic actor that his presence will sell a show Damn United will always be a favourite for me and uh, while I'm enjoying his current Doctor role I would have loved him to have been the final Doctor Who did, uh, uh, did you have any Doctor Who conversations? My, well I did I did an episode of Doctor Who um, uh, one of my great heroes uh, is Neil Gaiman who I've uh, who's a comic writer, book writer yeah. comic book writer and novel writer as well now, um, and he wrote an episode of Doctor Who, and he asked me if I would be the voice of this asteroid in it. So I provided the voice of the asteroid, and that's my only Doctor Who presence so far. But my daughter Lily um, texted me the other day and said, "I am very angry that you are not the new Doctor Who," <laughs> uh, to which I replied, "I want to be a Dalek." Oh, that would there you go. I would like to be Davros. Yeah. Davros no, is the that'd coolest be great. Dav- Absolutely, really was. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so maybe Davros in the and future. And Peter Capaldi is going to be amazing. Mm. And Peter Capaldi is just extraordinary. Mm. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, that. me too, likewise. Um, let's move on to John Newman. And the album is called Tribute, and it went straight in at number one. This is how it sounds. So there you go. That was John Newman. Uh, tracks you heard, All I Need is You, Out of My Head, Losing Sleep, and Love Me Again. He's only 23 years old. Yeah. Um, and yeah, great voice. You were just saying, Michael, oh, that you I like what you heard. I think he's good news. I... I get very excited when I hear his voice and that Love Me Again single loved mm. that and the video was amazing as well yeah. I think he's he great a great character when he came in it reminded me a bit of Boy George he's got this great laugh um, and yeah, he's quite a big guy really really big guy and yeah full character yeah, great character as well um, and you know number one ahead of Paul McCartney that's not bad for your debut album is it mm. and what do you attribute this to it's just got I and mean, like you say Love Me Again is probably one of the singles well it's definitely one of the singles of the year but it's like right up there as perhaps the best single of the year mm. it's an amazing single and you know he's done two great tracks of Rudimentals so he's kind of got 
the sort of dance music credibility and he's you know this kind of neo soul thing has been done but he's but he's doing it really well it's mm. say great songs he's kind of adding sort of house music references to it and it's just to say he's really strong it's like a breakup record there's lots of really heartfelt emotion there's a torch in there. songs on there yeah there's, there's a couple there's of slow ones couple yeah, of ballads, yeah. yeah. And, and, and he does those he's got a great voice but you know it's i think his up-tempo stuff is the best stuff yeah um someone was saying that they thought he stole the thunder from the, like james arthur went it's kind of the same sort of thing that james arthur might be yeah. trying to do but he's doing it in a bit of a cooler way yeah and it's nice that he's not come out of a talent show and that sort of thing. he's just come out of nowhere isn't he he's just he's come out of writing really good singles you know and, yeah. and, and that's you know being on the rudimental stuff who we met in a bar by by accident but you know he's got a good voice he's pushed at it and you know he's, he's got there mm. and who will this appeal to is it kind of across all ages i think it will i think i think the kids like it you know he's definitely playing to a kind of radio one audience but i would imagine a radio two audience the slightly older uh mm-hmm. audience is liking it the too i mean i think you well. could see it being you know the emily sandy you know right now that the emily sandy album, album's just gone past two million sales in the uk which is just phenomenal in this mm-hmm. day and age and you can imagine john newman is is that kind of artist that could really sell for a long time okay so out of five four four okay did we get what share was and just realized three and a half oh better than paul mccartney and mm. yeah well it's yeah. just it's sort of fun you know it's a fun <laughs> record it's enjoyable okay but john newman gets four so we'll play the track from it this is but in summary chris out of the just four a, albums i mean that's to... another good example that's kind of massive attack isn't it? It, it it just it just he's got lots of good songs you know if, you, if you've liked what you've heard before then it's definitely a, a sound investment okay so if anybody's listening to the show right now and they're thinking oh, i'm just gonna buy one album this week yeah give it a go John Newman yes. attribute. Chris, thank you very much indeed. Michael Sheen is still here. Um, you've chosen a Queens of the Stone Age track for us yes. to play next. Tell us why. Uh, uh, I've been a fan of Queens of the Stone Age for a while, but I uh, in LA I had the great honour of being able to go to a live session that they did for um, my local radio station in LA is called KCRW, which is National Public Radio, and it is possibly the greatest music show apart from the Joe Wiley show. Yeah, of course. Um, that I've ever heard. And um, they asked me to come down to, do, to to be able to listen to a live session the Queens of the Stone Age were doing at the release of this album. So I was in, in the recording studio. There were literally about 50 people in there. Gosh. And they did this. And it was one of the great music experiences of my life. I just think they're amazing. And listening to the Arctic Monkeys album, you can hear that like that Josh Homme's influence is all over that album yeah. and I think it's a great album I think he's him and uh, Dave Grohl have had such a massive influence on the music scene at the moment and and being able to watch him live he's mm. the most extraordinary performer I've seen I think Dave Grohl someone you've bumped into in your uh, I, funnily enough I was at um, a film premiere in LA because this is my life I was going to say what um, show beers uh, or what it was uh, the World's End premiere Edgar Wright's film and yeah. um and Dave Grohl was standing literally next to me at one point in the bar. I couldn't speak to him. You didn't say I anything. I just watched the um, documentary you did, uh, the, the Sound, Sound City, City documentary, one. which is, I, anyone who hasn't seen it, watch it. Um, and I was so in awe of him. I was already in awe of him, but even more in awe of him after that, that I just couldn't speak to him. So I just stood there, like, my heart pounding. About, da- about Dave Grohl. That's yeah. happened to many people, I think. I'm sure. You're, you're not alone. Sure. We'll play Queens of the Stone Age, and you've chosen this track. Any particular... Uh, it's just my favourite track on the new album. Queens of the Stone Age, and that was If I Had a Tale, and that was the choice of Michael Sheen. So if you had to choose between, in one room you have Dave Grohl, and in mm. the other room you have Asia, who would you spend the time oh, with? I you'd know see it. a man split apart. Really? You'd see a man's organ spill onto the floor. That song, how long, how long was that song? Four minutes and 22 seconds. You talked about Dave Grohl for nearly the entire <laughs> length of that I record. I am in love with Dave Grohl. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's been really nice having you on the show tonight. Oh, Thank you very much lovely. indeed. You. Um, do you cook at all? You, or do uh, no, I have not. For you? I have eaten out every meal for the last 12 years. For your life, really. Yeah. Never in the kitchen. Okay. Um, I just have to urge our listeners, if you are one of those people who do actually bake, we're going to do this baking mixtape tomorrow. So any songs you can think of, any ridiculous puns, like Andy and Kent just said, um, how about doing I Left My Tart in San Francisco? We'll do puns. That's fine. I only have pies for you or Gatto gets you into my life. Anything like that. Throw them at us. 88291 is a text. um, Or otherwise email me. It's joe.wiley at bbc.co.uk. And you've chosen, Michael, the last song that we're going to play tonight. Uh, Yeah. This is my the greatest song of all time as far as I'm concerned. It's written by the father of Jeff Buckley that mm-hmm. people might be aware of. This is Song to the Siren and I think this is genius. <laughs> 